You have found the Lions Preakness podcast for 2024, the second leg of the Triple Crown in horse racing. My name is Steven Andres, managing editor at thelines.com. Joined on our Preakness pod this year by a very special guest. Her name is Caitlin Free. She is a reporter and handicapper at Churchill Downs. And if you've been on social media over the last couple of weeks, you may recognize her. She is the one with the viral moment who nailed the trifecta in a very difficult trifecta to nail, Caitlin. So congratulations on that hit. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you. What's been like the coolest moment over the past, you know, we're recording here on Tuesday, so a little bit more than a week uh, from from you nailing that video and all the fallout that's come from it. <sighs> Honestly, getting a shout out from Kirk Herbstreet was pretty cool <laughs> because being from Ohio, being a Reds fan and just, you know, being in sports broadcasting to have the respect of somebody that kind of has reached the pinnacle in our job is just something that's really, really cool. But honestly... This whole derby was very special because to see kind of hometown people and Brian Hernandez Jr. and Kenny McPeak, just two really good people that I've gotten to know so well over the past 10 years, be able to pull something off like this and then also to win the Kentucky Oaks has just been very, very special. Yeah, I I couldn't agree with you more. We were just talking off air before this. We're we're literally like a few blocks from each other. We didn't realize it. We're both from Louisville. The Derby is very special to us, Mm -hmm. but the Triple Crown in general is special to us as well. And obviously the next step of that is the Preakness in Pimlico, just around the Baltimore area. And as we get ready to handicap this race, Caitlin, let's first start with the post positions And the morning line odds, unlike the Derby with a 20-horse field, we only have nine this time around. Not all of these horses for the novices out there did run in the Kentucky Derby. So just quickly going through, the number one Mugatu is 20-1. to The number two Uncle Heavy is 20-1. to Both of those are new shooters, as we say, horses that are running in the Preakness who did not run in the Kentucky Derby. Number three is Catching Freedom, who finished fourth in the Derby at 6-1. to Number four is the morning line favorite at eight to five, Bob Baffert's Muth, who would have been one of the favorites in the Derby if he was not suspended at Churchill Downs. Number five, Mystic Dan, of course, the Derby winner at five to two. Number six, Seize the Gray, and number seven, Just Steel, are both trained by D. Wayne Lucas, and both are 15 to one. The number eight, Tuscan Gold, is a new shooter, finished third in the Louisiana Derby behind Catching Freedom, trained by Chad Brown. And this is not Chad Brown's first rodeo when it comes to saving a horse for the Preakness. We'll get into that, I'm sure, with Caitlin. And number nine is a second Bob Baffert horse, finished second in the Santa Anita Derby, Imagination, at 6-1. to You know, one of the first things I want to talk about here, Caitlin, is betting strategy when it comes to the Preakness versus the Kentucky Derby. If we look at historical payouts in these two races, they are vastly different just because there are fewer horses in the Preakness, just because of the nature of you know, favorites hitting the board more often in the Preakness. If you look at exact payouts from the Derby over the past few years, all of them over the past four years have been at least $250. The Preakness, the last four exact payouts for a $2 exacta have been less than $100. And you can see that kind of so on and so forth if you go through the trifectas and the superfectas. So just for you personally, how does your overall betting strategy change in the Preakness versus two weeks ago? in the derby well it's definitely different because like you said there's less variables in the preakness and so often there's not really any types of prices that hit that exacta um, or that trifecta in this type of race it's not really a race that historically falls apart the way the kentucky derby can whereas the kentucky derby whether you're betting your tries or your supers there's so often that a horse is 15 to 1 or higher Almost every year, there's a horse that will sneak in like that. You just don't see that with the Preakness because either an outside horse that is a new shooter or the Kentucky Derby winner, those are going to be those two first and second choices. And most of the time, one of those is going to finish in that top two, if not win the race. We haven't seen a Derby winner win the race since Justify. And of course, he went on to win the Triple Crown, but we haven't had a lot of Derby winners running in it as of late so because we had the COVID year which the derby winner did run in it that year he was beaten uh, but he did finish second and that's rich strike didn't go um country house was injured so he didn't go um and then other times it's maybe not gone quite as well so it, it's interesting to see mystic dan back and for him to have a legitimate chance in this race 
I kind of put your feet to the fire here. I know, I know you know the guy a little bit, but it seemed to me his first reaction after the race was hesitancy in wanting to run Mystic Dam back in two weeks. Was that kind of your, your vibe too? Well, the way I know Kenny McPeak is one thing I really respect about him. He's not afraid to run his horses, mm -hmm. not at all. So he was going to have a horse in this race, no matter what, whether it was Mystic Dan or whether it was Thorpedo Anna who won the Kentucky Oaks. So I think he kind of had to give a little bit of hesitancy and kind of pump the brakes a little bit to see how the horse did the last couple of uh, days coming out of the Derby. But I mean, unless there was any red flags with the horse, I think that he was always probably going to go. Um, and especially the way this race kind of looks on paper with there being a chance that Mystic Dan could get a similar type of a trip and be pretty close behind what's maybe going to be quick to reasonable speed. I, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't have wanted to send him. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, just to kind of put a, a, an exclamation point on, on the greater trend that you mentioned, in the 21st century, only seven horses have won the Derby and the Preakness, and none since the horse you mentioned, Justify, in 2018. So that's five consecutive years where the Derby winner has either not run or failed to, to get into the winner's circle in the Preakness. So, uh, But with that being said, it doesn't mean that we're getting great prices because I think the betting public is aware of this, right? You, know, you get a new shooter like Muth in here, especially with the Baffert caveat and his suspension. Everybody knows he's a good horse and is you know well-rested and ready to go. People felt the same way about early voting. So even though we're not getting Derby winners in the winner's circle, it doesn't mean we're getting great discounts on these other horses as well. No. So it's going to make us have to be a little bit more conservative with our betting strategies going into this. So, uh, Caitlin, let's get into it then. Let's go post by post here, talk about some of these horses, and then at the end we'll share who our top win bet is and any exactas we're eyeing here. Uh, let's start with the number one post, and it is a new shooter. And it is a horse that was trying to get into the Kentucky Derby field in Mugatu, was the, the last horse on the bubble when it was all said and done and did not get in. Trained by Jeff Engler, jockey is Joe Bravo, again, one of the two long shots at 20 to 1. Uh, this is not a horse I'm considering on my tickets, but I'm curious if, if you disagree or if you agree with me. I could see him maybe sneaking in for a third or fourth. I think that's as best as this horse can do. I think it's really interesting, though. Um, he was, he's just kind of a chug along type of a horse. He's one for 12 lifetime. Those are the types of horses that can sometimes run in and get a relatively decent type of position. I thought he ran decent in the bluegrass. He actually ran a lot better than I thought. Um, so I think maybe the added extra ground, the better for him. And it looks like he's been working pretty decently at Belterra. It would, uh, it would be quite a shock for, to see him get anything better than third, but, um, uh, the connections are very optimistic that this horse is going to continue to move forward. He is the most experienced horse in the field. So something to be said for the experiment experience, excuse me, but um, I, it, it's hard to see him being very, very legit in here. I agree. I think at worst, maybe I'm mixing him into some of the exotics yeah. in the third or fourth place position. That's the most I would go with Mugatu here, just really more so on the, on the rest factor and, and not coming back off of two weeks. So uh, I'm with you on that. Uncle heavy is the other long shot. Uh, ironically, next to Mugatu in the gate at number two at 20 to one. Uh, again, a horse that had the points if he wanted to be entered in the Kentucky Derby, did wound up not doing so. Gets Irad Ortiz Jr. here, who is always going to maximize the horse that he's riding. He's a well respected rider, that's for sure. Um, I thought that he had some excuses in the Wood Memorial with deposition getting turned and, and you know, just kind of a the horse racing equivalent of a NASCAR wreck around yeah. the far turn there. So and I this think horse was involved in all that. And I don't think people were getting, giving that enough credence and just kind of chucking mm -hmm. him saying, Oh, well, he ran really poorly in the wood. Well, <laughs> most of the horses did run poorly in a wood in the wood because there was a, a horse that tripped and fell was right. okay in the middle of the stretch. And I mean, so many horses had to avoid that. So I, I'm with you. I don't think that I, I think you can draw a line through that race. Yeah, I agree. So, so what do we do then? I mean, is this a horse that you think can get a piece of this or? Um, Absolutely. Interesting. All right, go on. I, I think, I think he can definitely grab a piece of this. I thought I, I was actually a little sad that he didn't run in the Derby because I thought he could have been a bomb big piece grabber in this race. Um, I'm just concerned the pace is not going to be quite quick enough for him to really, really have a chance to get there. But I mean, other than, 
um, a race where he dwelled at the start, plus a uh, wood memorial where, you know, we mentioned a horse ended up going down in that race. He's literally done nothing wrong. And I think he really improves with a little bit of moisture in the track. So if there is some rain in the forecast, potentially the day before, and there's still a little bit of wetness in the track come post time, the way there was for the Kentucky Derby, I think this horse gets a little bit more interesting. Um, that being said, I do have to say, I'm really disappointed that Michael Sanchez does not have this mount because he knows this horse and has done nothing wrong on him. And I know that Irad's probably the best jockey in the country, but he doesn't know the horse. So that's kind of really the only caveat, not to say that he can't ride him and finish really well, but this is definitely a horse that I think, I don't know if he'll get 20 to one. I think he'll get at least 15 to one, but he's, he's definitely one I'm going to be looking for in my tries. All right, let's uh, let's put a pin in that and maybe see how you're going to use him at the end of the pod here. Let's move forward here with the number three horse catching freedom, six to one on the morning line odds. Uh, you know, I go through my Kentucky Derby handicapping process and, you know, looking at final fractions and buyer speed figures and Brisnet and how do they do in the last race and, you know, catching freedom with fierceness really checked all of those boxes for me on paper. And I don't think I can really criticize him too much for coming in fourth he got a pace to run into i'll give him that i'm not sure we'll get the same hot pace this time and he's also coming off just two weeks rest here so i can't say i'm as bullish on catching freedom but considering we are talking about um you know a bunch of other horses that clearly were not in his tier at least going into the kentucky derby i do at least wonder if he can still maybe get the bottom of of trifectas and supers here and he can. And I think Flavian Pratt's been a pretty good fit for this horse. One thing that I will say about Catching Freedom, and he's never been a horse that I've been overly in love with, he kind of has a pattern about him where he runs. A win on the board. Win on the board. Win on the board. Now he's coming into maybe what could be potentially his best race, and he continues to kind of improve with every start. But it seems like he kind of has that same type of a pattern. So I also think it's kind of interesting. This is Brad Cox's not typical style at all to bring horses back this quickly. Right. So I have mixed feelings on catching freedom. I think I'm going to maybe need to think about it a couple more days to decide what to do with him. But I'm warming up to him a little bit more in the Preakness than maybe I did the Derby because there's less horses. But he didn't quicken and finish the same way as Mystic Dan. But I'm wondering, I don't know. I, I just I have such mixed feelings on this horse. Yeah, I, I agree with you. To me, it's because he's a closer who won the Louisiana Derby despite a mild pace. Like, that was only 48 and change in the Louisiana, and he still closed like a freight train to get to that, that finish line. You know, typically when you get to this level and you have deep closers like that, you need a much hotter pace on the front end. So, I mean, if we get that, maybe, but I on two weeks rest – with Baffert, potentially, we'll get into this next with Muth, but I think Baffert could control the pace in this race with his two horses in it. Um, I'm not sure Catching Freedom is going to get the setup on the front end. He needs to maximize his chances here. That's just kind of my opinion, even though I loved him in the Derby. All right, let's move forward to Muth now, the morning line favorite at 8-5. to five. And, you know, full transparency here, I, I do have a Muth ticket from one of the Preakness Futures pools uh, where he closed 19-1. to one. So that's why I wanted to have you on. I, I know it's a bit of a humble brag. I'm sorry, but it's not going to help anybody that's listening to the podcast right now. So no, but it helps that, you. <laughs> the, so we need we need to have you on to talk about what to do with Muth now that he's eight to five. Because my betting strategy personally is going to differ from you know 99 percent of the audience that's out there. So wins the Arkansas Derby, pretty handily beats the Kentucky Derby winner Mystic Dan in that race. Just steal another horse in this Preakness, finished second in that race. Obviously, first question I want to ask you, if Baffert was not suspended, you know, if we think back to the post-time odds for the Derby, Fierceness was the favorite. We had other horses like Forever Young and Catching Freedom at the top, Sierra Leone. Where do you think Muth would have slotted in there if he was in the Derby? Third or fourth choice. Yeah, that's about where I had him too. I agree. Because I think it's fairly obvious that this horse is – on his best days and on the best days with everyone else compared to Fierceness and Sierra Leone, he's not even close. And I think that this is just kind of what Baffert has left. This is not even close to being his top three-year-old horse. That's just my opinion. Right. That was Nysos, right? Like if Nysos was yeah. healthy, 
it was clearly that that was his best yes. horse and maybe yeah. Muth is the second best second or third i would say um there uh may moon is pretty good for him too he is also on the shelf um so second or third for me or uh, Muth, but i think nisos was far and away his top three-year-old and i just i've never just really been that big of a fan of Muth, and it has nothing to do you know with baffert or anything like that it's just like this is just kind of he's just He's not that fast, but then again, none of these horses are really overall. overall maybe like that another fast. way to say it is is high high floor, but maybe lower ceiling. Yeah, yeah, that's probably a pretty good way to put it. I mean, he's coming in; he's won both of his races this year, but he just like he hasn't blown me away. Mm -hmm. Well, with that being said, though, the context is this field, right, in this Preakness field, yep. where the top Derby horses have only had two weeks rest. The other new shooters were not good enough to be in the Kentucky Derby. Maybe Uncle Heavy in the bottom of the standings if, if they would have stayed with it. But uh, So this is not your typical new shooter. This is a very unusual new shooter that mm -hmm. was clearly good enough to be in the Kentucky Derby. So yeah. maybe he's not the best Baffert horse, but maybe, I mean, is he the rightful morning line favorite and is 8-5 to five the right price? That's that's what's tough. This is the first time in a long time that the Kentucky Derby winner when participating in the Preakness hasn't been the morning line favorite. Um, right. I, I understand that. And Muth coming in fresh, he is the horse to beat in here. Um, and he has beaten Mystic Dan before. For, so from that, it does make sense. But he's going to get way bet down in this race. Way bet down. I think he's going to be lower than maybe 8-5. to five. I mean, as a futures ticket holder, that's fine by me. That, that gives me even more options. I'm good with that. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I do agree with you, though, that, I mean, if, if I was coming in cold here with, with nothing, then that would be, if he's if he's shorter than 8 to 5, he gets down to even money, That that's a really hard price to swallow. So yeah. we'll see what you're doing with that at the end of the pod here when we get into our bets. Let's talk about the Derby winner, the number 5 horse, Mystic Dan, at 5 to 2. I mean, what, what do you want to say now? I mean, he's done everything he was supposed to do. Um, yes, the, the trip was golden. <laughs> you know, it could not have gone any better in terms of the trip. But I also at least want to point out that the top five horses at the front end of the Kentucky Derby all faded to the very back of the pack, except Mystic Dan, who won the race. And yes, he only won by a nose, but man, he showed some fight to get to the wire. Yeah, and Brian Hernandez did everything right. So I'm guessing he's going to try to replicate all of that here with Mystic Dan and the Kentucky Derby. And a lot of people were worried about the two-week turnaround after running such a big race in the Derby. I get that. But this horse was back on three weeks rest to break his maiden impressively as a two-year-old. And he rebounded off of a month rest to win nicely in the Southwest. So like I said, Kenny McPeak runs his horses. So I, the um, time between, I don't think is really too much of a concern to me. It's just gonna be, is he good enough against fresh horses? And he might be, he was good enough to yeah. beat horses that I wasn't quite sure he could beat in the Kentucky Derby. So, and, and I think that the Preakness distance is better for him because I mean, mile and a 16th, mile and an eighth is fine for him. Mile and a quarter was really stretching it and he had to save every inch of ground and still oh, yeah. almost ran out of gas. So uh, I think this race is better for him, you know, distance wise. We'll just have to see how much the Derby took out of him. But I, the two week turnaround really isn't too much of a concern for me. Okay, all right. Keep that in the back of our heads here as we move forward. Number six is Seize the Gray at 15 to 1, uh, trained by D. Wayne Lucas. And this horse wins the Pat Day mile, uh, getting to run into a blistering half mile time of 44 and a half. Uh, not sure we're going to get that in the Preakness. Not sure he likes the extra distance. This to me seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, Caitlin, this. This is a horse that has like crowdsourced ownership. Yeah. So it's like every, a, a lot of people have a very small stake in this horse. So yes, if he gets the chance to run in the Preakness after winning the Pat Day mile, then then why not give him a shot? Although Dean Wayne Lucas is not afraid to run his horses, that's for darn sure. But it seems like, you know, they're taking a shot because of the ownership of this horse more than anything. He's going to get bet. I know he's going to get bet because yeah. of the ownership group. So whatever number he goes off at, it's going to be too low based on what he should go off at because of the My Race horse owners. Um, 
I actually kind of prefer this horse instead of just steel in this race. That being said, it's going to be a big ask, but Jamie Torres is a great fit for this horse. So I do like that. And I think there's a chance that he's going to be the one pressing behind the Baffert horses and could be forcing the issue a little bit, but the distance is a little bit concerning. Yeah. That was the main question I had is how he factors into the pace here. Mm -hmm. If, if, you know, if you had to give a problem, I mean, this is a tough question to ask, so for, forgive me in advance, but you know, what probability do you give of Seize the Grey, like compromising Muth and imagination on the front end and, and turning this into a, a suicidal pace? I don't think it's super, super likely, but I think it's possible. I don't think he's going to be right up there with imagination because the imagination is the one I see for it. I think he's going to be back there with Muth, though, keeping him company. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Just Steele at 15-1, to 1, the other Dwayne Lucas in the seven post. Uh, again, D Wayne is, is not afraid to to run. Like, these two horses have run a lot of races in their two and three year old campaigns. Um, about the most head scratching ride I saw in the Kentucky Derby, you know, he had been middle of the pack most of his races, and all of a sudden he's out there on the lead with Track Phantom in the Kentucky Derby. I don't know what the hell that was. Uh, frankly, it just makes me want to draw a line through the race, but also he's only coming back in two weeks and, um, hasn't won all that often in his career. So, you know, I don't really know what to make of this horse. And if, if it was more rest, I might consider him and just draw a line through the Derby. And I know I I'm pretty darn confident. We don't see that again with him on the front end. Uh, I'm, I'm confused by this horse for the Preakness. So am I, because I think he's way better than what he showed in the Derby. I'm with you that I was not expecting that in the slightest. And I think it's a big ask to bring a horse back that was beaten 34 lengths um, in the Kentucky Derby off of two weeks rest. But if he sets a patient ride and Joel Rosario has won the two lifetime wins on this horse. So he knows this horse pretty well. So as long as he sits a pressing type of a trip, I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibility. He He's another one that I'm just like, I have no idea what to expect from this horse. I have no idea what to do with this horse. Um, he's thrown in some real clunkers in his career, and it's usually when he's closer up on the pace. So I would hope that that same mistake would not be made again twice. Working backwards, Just Steele's finishes. 17th in the Kentucky Derby, 2nd in the Arkansas, 7th in the Rebel, 2nd in the Southwest behind Mystic Dan, 2nd in the Smarty Jones, um, and then before that is his two-year-old campaign where he did win his last race as a two-year-old, uh, the Ed Brown back in November. So yeah, I mean, it's like a seesaw here. Like I've heard other handicappers talk about horses that, you know, are in that zigzag pattern. Are you one to subscribe to that theory? You know, Mystic Dan theoretically could fit into that. Um, only finished third in a race before coming off of his career race and then, you know, if you zigzag off of that, he wins the Kentucky Derby, right? So it's like an up-down pattern with some of these horses. I'm not sure I totally buy into that, but I'm curious if you've heard it and what you think of it. I do to a degree, and I think the biggest horse that fits in that category was Fierceness. Um, he yeah. was so all or nothing. And, I mean, there was such a big pattern that I feel like if you were any type of a serious handicapper, you had to know that was coming in the Derby or that it was a big possibility. And him being as heavy of a, as a favorite if he was, I wanted no part of that. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I tossed him on a ton of exotics. It, I still made $0, but I at least got that right, Caitlin. Yeah, I at I least got that it. right. If he finished in the top four, I lost everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he did not finish on, in the top four. No. And thank God for the Oaks Derby double. That's all I'll say. Yes. <laughs> uh, number eight is a horse I'm very intrigued by. Tuscan Gold. Third in the Louisiana Derby. But more importantly, trained by Chad Brown, who is no stranger to saving a horse for the Preakness. And here we go again with Tuscan Gold. Right, Caitlin? Yeah, absolutely. This horse fits the bill the same way Cloud Computing in early voting did. He's training pretty forward um, at the Belmont Training Center coming into this race. He had a little bit of a break following his first start of his two-year-old season where he finished behind Sierra Leone. 
um, and then ran at Gulfstream, broke his maiden going two turns, and then going the three sixteenths of a distance, still ran pretty well uh, to finish third in the Louisiana Derby, his first try at a graded stake behind Catching Freedom. He's had the time off. I think it's clear he can get the distance and he took a big jump up forward with that third place finish. I think he's going to be able to set a nice tracking trip in this race um, under Tyler Gaffleon. Yeah, big consideration for me, that's for sure. Um, I think if you are into buyer speed figures, a lot of these other new shooters are horses that really don't fit the bill. They would they need mm -hmm. to take big jumps if if Mystic Dan or Muth runs back to their last race. Tuscan Gold, despite that third in Louisiana Derby, did get a 95 buyer speed figure, and he's lightly raced, which means you know the, the ceiling and the arrow is – is still pointing up here yep. for Tuscan Gold. Absolutely. Uh, the last, yeah, the, and last but not least, the number nine horse, Imagination, another Bob Baffert horse in this race, uh, lost a stretch duel to Stronghold in the Santa Anita Derby. Stronghold finishes seventh in the Kentucky Derby. The buyer speed figures were not kind to the Santa Anita Derby, uh, but what are we doing they here with? <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. I, I agree with you. I didn't use Stronghold in anything in the Kentucky Derby, so uh, I actually was a little surprised that he still finished seventh, but I think that was just a matter of the pace breaking down and him being um, you know, a little bit further back in the pack. But what are we doing with Imagination now in the Preakness? I think he's your speed in this race. Um, mm. There's some other horses that can be forward, but this is a speedy type of a horse, and I think his only chance to win the Preakness is to try to go wire to wire. Um, I don't think he's going to be able to hold off um, the oncoming stablemate and the rest of all the horses. It's just going to depend on how much he gets pressed in this race. He can go 23, 47, um, 47, 22, something like that, and be able to hang on. But he's also stretching out in distance, and he will be pressed in here. So I don't really see a scenario where he wins the race, but... Um, he controls the race. So he, he's a very pivotal horse in here. Right. So for me, I'm of the opinion that we get a pretty mild pace here. I think the half yeah, mile I would time. Agree with that. Yeah. I don't, I don't think we see anywhere near the 46 and change we saw on the Derby. So that's, that's my first opinion. And if that is the opinion, then that kind of keeps closers off the top line for me and maybe even the second line. Uh, but maybe imagination can still hold on for a piece of this in third and fourth, even if he if he fades a little bit down the stretch. So, um, to hell with what who I think is going to win. You're the one that hit the trifecta in the Derby, Caitlin. Who, who who you got here? If you had to pick one horse and one horse only, our friends over at FanDuel Racing are giving everybody a twenty dollar no sweat win bet. You can find the details down in the description. If you're new to FanDuel Racing, you get up to a five hundred dollar no sweat win bet. So if you only have one horse. To bet on for the Preakness, who are you going with? Tuscan Gold. I love it. I love it. Why him over Muth and Mystic Dan at the end of the day? Because I think this is maybe the horse that's the most under the radar. We've seen Chad Brown do this multiple times now. He almost did it last year with Catching Freedom, too. And this horse has been working with Catching Freedom. Uh, Chad said he's coming in off of some of the best works he's had. He's just a horse that, as you said, I think the ceiling is maybe higher with at this point in time. I think Mystic Dan is maybe even a better horse than Muth. Um, I just... We'll see how much the Derby took out of him. I've never been a huge Muth fan. As I said, it's got nothing to do with the Baffert situation. I just don't think that horse is, he doesn't stand out to me as much as maybe some people make it out to be, in my opinion. Damn it, um, Caitlin. I got 19 to 1 futures on this horse. You're killing me. If it was Nysos, the conversation would be different. <laughs> well, I would not have 19 to 1 on Nysos. That's, yeah. I think he was like, whoever bet him, I'm like, Five months in advance, betting a horse like four to one or something. That was not a great idea. No, wasn't a great idea. So I just, um, if you're looking to be Muth and Mystic Dan, I think this is the horse you have to do it with because I think he's going to potentially be the value play in this race with those horses kind of taking the lion's share of the money. And like I said, we've seen Chad Brown do this before. And based on what I see on paper, the numbers, the figures, this horse is going to continue to move forward. Is it going to be good enough to beat the two in this race? We'll see, but I think if he jumps up one more rung, he's right there with him. Any exotics you want to share as well? And again, we are recording on Tuesday afternoon. There's a lot of time between now and race day. So uh, follow Caitlin on X. 
if you want to get more insights as we get closer to race day at Caitlin Free. That's Caitlin K A I T L I N Free. So any any exotics, early week thoughts for these tickets. I still really like Uncle Heavy is an underneath type of a play. I don't think he's going to get the pace that maybe he wants, but I think this is the best horse when it comes to distance. He's a horse that kind of just keeps coming as long as, you know, something's not going on in front of him. I think he's a horse that particularly um, would be interesting to me in the Belmont Stakes. Um, the Belmont Stakes mile and a quarter this year. If it was a mile and a half, I would be all over this horse in the Belmont. He still, I think, would be interesting to me going a mile and a quarter in um, the Belmont. But this is a horse that's going to keep coming as long as he's in the clear. Him taking a step forward to win the race, I think, is unlikely at this point because he's really going to have to move forward and he's going to need to be aided by a pace that I don't think is going to be anything more than moderate to honest. Um, but as far as the horses that are going to be finishing best of all, he's, he's a big candidate. Okay. So I agree with you, especially if it's in the context of Vandal racing, giving you a no sweat win bet or some of the other promotions that are out there. I don't want to use that on an eight to five. And you and I both agree. We don't even think he's going to be that for Muth. So that to me is a perfect spot to use one of those promos on Tuscan gold for a win bet. Mm -hmm. Even for me holding a 19 to one Muth, I am still going to sprinkle some Tuscan gold. Uh, on the win line, just hope because I think those are the two most likely winners in this race, even though Mystic Dan did just win the Kentucky Derby. I will kind of fall in line here with the trend of new shooters at, and fresh legs for the Preakness. I even might consider uh, just a cold exacta between those two. Maybe just put those two on my top line for trifecta or top two lines for trifectas in the first and second place positions to give me a little more flexibility underneath in the third place position. So, but again, don't want to spread it too much. Um, you know, the horses I am definitely not using in the Preakness on trifectas or exactas would be Mugatu, Seize the Gray, and Just Steel. I think I'm out on those horses. Um, any horses you're tossing as we wrap up? Mugatu, I would think, um, is very much up against it. I would probably be more apt to toss Just Steel over Seize the Gray because I just like I'm so baffled. I'm so baffled with that yeah. horse that if he came back and won the whole thing, it wouldn't shock me. But if he came back and run, ran last again, it still wouldn't shock me. Imagination too, I think. Yeah, you don't want imagination either? I don't think so. I don't think he's good enough. Yeah, fair enough. I think I'm going to agree with you on that one. Uh, Caitlin, so, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. It was so much fun. I do hope you hit another trifecta because this time it means I'll probably hit a trifecta too. Cause I'm just going to tail your bets. <laughs> so, and, and we got to like, you know, meet up at some point here. We're, yes. we're literally like right down the street from each other, a little Louisville pride. Uh, so Absolutely. thank you again. Maybe I'll see you over at the track one of these days during the spring meet. All right. Sounds good. Don't be a stranger. Love it. For the rest of you. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can go to lines.com upper right hand corner hit the discord button continue the conversation there for all our horse racing betting strategies and bets talk to you later <laughs>